Hi, everybody. So glad that you could be here today. I'm going to get my screen up and rolling. Uh, let's see here. So um, I'm really excited to share about how technology can really help us as organists um, enhance our musical practice. So a little bit about me. Um, well, you know, my name is Lindsay Johnson, but um, I am working on my master's degree at Arizona State University right now. And I've been using my iPad um, since 2006. 17 um, for all of my musical endeavors. Um, so that means I've been using it from church work to choral accompanying, academic study, performances, and I really actually really enjoy using my iPad and I'm excited to present that to you. So before we get started, um, I wanted to ask how many of you have never used a tablet for music at all? Okay, I see a couple. Perfect. Um, do we have any out there that are thinking of transitioning but haven't quite done that yet or have a tablet and haven't started using that? Um, I think there's a couple there. And um, do we have any regular four score users currently? Awesome, great. Uh, glad to see that that's already something that you're familiar with. So um, there is something in this presentation for each one of you, and uh, I think that we'll all be able to take something away from this today. Um, so this presentation is actually being recorded. Uh, you should have gotten a memo about that, and it will be posted to YouTube later, and I will be um, sharing the links to this presentation and a couple of my notes that you can use um, as, you, as you consider this um, prospect. And um, so I would recommend um, having a way to jot down some notes or some questions. Um, during this session, we will not be stopping for questions because we will have a 15 minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So uh, you can also send them through the direct message chat too. So um, at the end, I'll be taking a look at those and see what we can um, uh, talk about after that. So let's get started. Uh, to get started, I wanted to share this quote by Steve uh, Ballmer. He's the former CEO of Microsoft. The number one benefit of information technology is that it empowers people to do what they want to do. It lets people be creative. It lets people be productive. It lets people learn things they didn't think they could learn before. And so in a sense, it's all about potential. Whoa. Everybody okay? Um, so it's all about potential. Um, and I felt like this was an important quote to share um, for setting a precedent to why we would use technology. Uh, technology is a tool that allows us to be creative and productive, but it's all just potential. So what I'm going to be sharing in this session is um, uh, a way that will to, to show us a way that will allow us to maximize this potential. So um, I think it's an important uh, option to discuss the pros and cons of digital sheet music on tablets versus the physical printed sheet music. For any of us who are considering transitioning to a tablet, or even for those of us who have transitioned, just to, um, to take a look at these. So for starters, let's talk about some of our pros of the tablet. So um, tablets hold and organize large amounts of music, which can be very convenient. They are lightweight and portable. Um, they also have their own um, light source, and um, that provides clarity to sheet music, so um, in more challenging settings. Um, they also, um, my favorite uh, score option for the tablet is the easy score marking interface, which I'm actually going to be spending some time talking about after um, in the tutorial, because uh, it's just one of the greatest features of the tablet. And then of course, the all-in-one access. So for example, during COVID, I taught several online Zoom sessions for piano lessons, and I was able to teach them from my iPad and also have the score that they were playing from on the iPad. So it's very versatile, even outside of our um, musical needs, uh, outside of the digital sheet music. So, of course, there are some cons, um, and the first one that comes to mind, that's kind of a big one, is that it is dependent on battery life. So if you run out of battery on your iPad, you're kind of out of luck. Um, and so there are some preventative measures that I take for that, and that is carrying an external charger, extra battery port, um, those kinds of things to, to always have something ready in case that that comes up. Of course, technical glitch, glitches come to mind. I will mention briefly that in the five years that I've been using my tablet, I've not had any horrifying experiences with glitches. 
Uh, but I do take some steps uh, that I will share later on how to prevent glitches. And um, if I can't get to it in this session, because we're sort of on a time crunch, uh, there will be some subsequent videos made after this with more information. So. Um, a couple of other cons here. Some people are really nervous about the page turns on tablets, but what I found is that it's actually a little bit safer to make a page turn on a tablet without um, uh, you, you're not actually physically moving anything. And so that minimizes the potential of things falling, ripping, slipping, or skipping pages. Um, those are some of the problems I've experienced with paper sheet music that you won't really have with the tablet since it's just a tap or there's actually several different ways that we can do page turns that I'm excited to share. Um, I was a bit apprehensive at the thought of having only one page viewable at a time. Um, uh, it was pretty common for me to tape several pages in a row so that there was less page turns. But of course, that also brings up its own uh, problems. You know, if you if one page slips and everything is taped together, you, you lose them all. Um, so other other issues. Um, might arise from that, but there's actually some features in Fourscore specifically that allow you to anticipate the one page problem where you can see other pages in advance. So um, there is um, a limit to your storage capacity, but it's not a huge impact. And uh, I'll be sharing some different storage capacity levels um, in a moment so that you can make the most informed decision as to how much storage you should get. Um, and of course, affordability. And that one um, can be a issue when it comes to picking a tablet. But I hope that this presentation helps you recognize that the um, that the opportunity to, to buy and um, start using a tablet is more, more of an investment rather than a financial burden. It's something that really will enhance your musicianship in the long run. So um, I'm sure there are other pros and cons that we could come up with, but those were the main ones that uh, that came to mind. So let's take a let's take a look at the pros and cons compared to our printed uh, sheet music. So starting with the pros, the tablets can store uh, large capacities of music in a small space, whereas printed sheet music can actually become very space consuming. I'm sure we've all seen music libraries that go from floor to ceiling with <laughs> binders and binders of books or loose, uh, loose sheet music just falling out. Um, imagine that bookcase, all of that sheet music fits into one tablet. And so that's really, really convenient, obviously. Um, Sheet music can be light and portable, but only if you take a limited amount. If you start needing to take much more, it can uh, become burdensome. Um, and of course, it is not a, it needs a good light source to function. We can't adjust the light source through, um, we would need an additional lamp or good lighting in the space. Um, and then there is somewhat of an easy notation marking system for the sheet music, uh, which I will talk about in comparison later when we get to the annotation. But um, I'm sure we've all made mistakes when we are marking in our scores, pedalings, and we have to go back and erase it. And this makes our scores messy. And over time, it can actually uh, diminish our score. And if we have registrations for different instruments, we uh, I've seen people write in different colors colored pencils. I have seen people use different sticky notes, which can eventually fall off and then you lose it. Um, so that's why I say that it's a little bit of a limited notation because yes, you can, but it is, there are, there are so many more features that the tablet allows for um, that I would say can be very, very effective. Um, and of course, singular access. So that just means that there are no additional features to the music. What you see is what you get. So if you need a metronome, you have to bring your own metronome. If you need um, to make any markings, you have to bring your own pencils or colored pencils or sticky notes and so on and so forth. Um, whereas all of that is, is pretty much found in, in the tablet. So um, moving on to the cons, um, the first one here is pretty big. Like I mentioned, the, the battery life. So with printed sheet music, you will always have access to your sheet music, um, unless you forgot it or you lost it or something. But there's no chance of not accessing your score if you have it with you. Um, there won't be any technical glitches because there's obviously no technical aspect. Um, however, um, I have seen musicians incorrectly arrange their music or other um, glitches 
perhaps that you might see with sheet music. Um, and in fact, with that one specifically, I was acting as registrant and had to rearrange their sheet music while pulling stops without messing them up. So it can it can get a little bit messy sometimes. But um, there are, um, I mentioned a few challenges with page turns, um, but uh, we've all experienced them. So I'm not really going to cover that. We all uh, know what those uh, challenges can be. Um, there are there is the ability to have multiple pages viewable at one time through taping or through managing um and uh you know i grew i grew up doing sheet music printed sheet music and i would have six or eight sheets you know taped together or double stacked and um you know it it did allow me to not have to do any page turns but it was also uh it could be very challenging and, and difficult to transport I, I was always having to fold them on top of each other and get they got all wrinkled and um so that was definitely challenging um i had an interesting experience i like to talk about um, digital versus paper options a lot and in january I, I was talking with a colleague about it and they mentioned oh i really like having all of my sheets taped together and I'm thinking, well, it's because they don't want to have to do any sort of page turn. And they continued on to say, well, it's because I find that if the audience can see how complex my piece is, they appreciate it more. So I thought that was an interesting take. Um, I personally maybe would not agree. I think that maybe making something challenging look um, easy, but sound fluid and easy is maybe a bit more impressive, but that's personal opinion, of course. Um, so um, moving on to the next point, there is not really um, storage capacity existing with printed sheet music, although I guess you could say you run out of bookshelf space or closet space, um, but that's not really as big of an issue. Uh, and then, of course, affordability. That really depends on the score. You can get free music on IMSLP or you can spend $100 to get a collection or, or a set of books. And so that one's a little bit variable. but. Those are our pros and cons um, of the tablet versus printed sheet music. And I just wanted to make that very obvious because you really do have to consider both as you're as you're looking at and 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 as you're looking at what it is that you're doing, practice, performance, or other. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's just move forward. Uh, let's talk now about the different types of tablets. So I have here a list of the top 10 tablets uh, from 2020, and the uh, option is there at the bottom to look at that later. But I've highlighted here the, the, the five that I find are most popular uh, in America, Apple, Samsung, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. So um, here is a graphic that I made that compares these five side by side. So there's a couple of things that we have to consider, and they're sort of outlined here by screen size, storage capacity, um, operating system, and then price. So if we're looking here at the different uh, tablet options, the Apple iPad Pro, which is the one that I use just for um, clarification, has two different uh, screen sizes, 12.9 and 11. So this is pretty much sheet music paper size. It's very legible. Um, if you look at the other ones, we start getting smaller on our screen sizes until we get to the Microsoft Surface Pro, which is actually going to be released tomorrow, interestingly enough. Um, and the Google Pixel won't be available until 2023. But moving further, uh, the biggest one that I want to focus on is our price, because of course, Apple is way up there, which is typical. But the reason for that, you can see here, the screen size is larger than our, all of our other options here. In fact, the Surface Pro that is the closest to the screen size is about the same price value of, of the Apple iPad Pro. The other one is the storage capacity. Of course, you want something that will be able to store all of your music, any recordings, videos. Um, I think I have the 256 gigabyte iPad, um, and I'm not anywhere near running out of space right now. Uh, scores are not high dense files. They're, they're usually very small. Um, and so your Apple iPad Pro offers these two different types of storage size, whereas the other two here, the Amazon and the Samsung, are um, smaller. We reach only the, the minimum of the iPad for the Galaxy, and the Fire HD doesn't come anywhere near even the minimum here. So, um, And that obviously affects the price. And so those are things to consider as, as you look forward to uh, 
making that purchase. We have info buttons here that are clickable. When I share this uh, presentation, you can actually go through and it, this links directly to each product if you want to take a closer look at that. Looking now at um, accessories. So the, the most important accessory that I have found for tablets is the pencil um, or your stylus. So the Apple Pencil is what I use because I have an Apple product um, and it works splendidly. This is the price range here. They have two kinds. You need to make sure that the kind that you're purchasing is compatible with your iPad. That's that one. Um, I have not used these other two styluses, but these were the other two most purchased um, stylus that I could find. Um, this one is compatible with Android and um, iOS for operating systems. And that's an important feature. If you have an iPad but don't want to buy an Apple Pencil, this would be the other one that you would want to get because it's compatible with that um, operating system. And here's our price range. And then the Samsung uh, Pencil only works with the Android. So uh, things to consider before purchasing your stylus. But it does make notation much easier. And I'll demonstrate that later in the tutorial by doing some drawing with my finger versus the stylus. And uh, it's actually quite fascinating to see how different that is. Um, so music apps. Today we'll be focusing on Fourscore when we get to that tutorial section, but um, there are lots and lots of music apps. Um, this orange one here is called Music. I would say that's a very, that, that would be my second choice for music apps to use on the iPad, and I do, you, I do have it, um, but it doesn't have all of the features that Fourscore has. Um, here we have uh, PIA score, like piano, PIA score, PIA. IMSLP has their own app, which is great. You can save IMSLP files in that app or export them to Fourscore. Um, we have Blackbinder, Kindle. You can actually buy music books through Kindle and have them uploaded there. This is um, musicnotes.com has their own um, app as well. Uh, this one is Coda with a silent N in front of it. Um, so these are... Uh, a comparison that uh, David McDonald did of the best iPad score readers. And so here's the link to that uh, source. If you want to compare and contrast a few more of these, you can go in more in depth with that later. But for now, we're going to move forward with four score specifically. So four score, it's kind of the big name of music um, apps for tablets. And there's a reason for it. It's the most um, feature filmed uh, app that I can find. And so a couple of things to know before we start. This is the most important thing to remember from today's um, session. The Fourscore app only functions with iOS system. That means that it only functions with Apple products, iPhone, iPad, MacBook Pro. And I didn't know that actually until I started preparing for this, sem this session. And I did a little bit of research as to why that might be. And I found this quote from Fourscore developers back in 2012. Um, this uh, tech for singers uh, blogger reached out to them and asked, hey, why don't we have an Android version? And this was their response. Um, and essentially what they said was that um, creating an Android version was going to be so different, it would be like creating an entirely new app. And that's not as nearly easy for them to do. And so that essentially it was not a snub, just a matter of our own capabilities. So of the tablets that we talked about, those are all options and there are apps that work with those tablets, but Fourscore specifically will only work with your Apple iPad, iPhone or MacBook Pro. And that's how they branded it. Look at this. These are all Apple products. And I don't have it here, but they usually in this image have an Apple Pencil right here. And so they have really marketed their app to Apple products specifically. So a couple of more things things to know here. Um, there are two versions of Fourscore, and it does it's not two separate apps. They're both contained within the same app, um, but there is a difference here with price and a couple of features. So Fourscore, we'll call it Fourscore Regular, it requires a one-time payment of $20, which seems hefty for an app. I don't think I'd ever paid that much before for an app, but really it's an investment. It's a one-time payment. Then your Fourscore app is compatible through any of your devices, Apple, MacBook, iPad, iPhone. And if it's if you remove it, you can re-download it and you didn't lose the purchase. It's, it's part of your Apple uh, account. Um, and so some of the features that we have, well, Fourscore um, regular has 
pretty much all features that you could ever want. So that's the capabilities of the music library, syncing with iCloud, all of the metadata editing. Um, you can add audio track backing for if you need to practice some kind of duet, you can upload just the one voice. Um, it has Bluetooth connection. You can do the half page turns, import PDFs, or even scan your own files. So almost everything that you would want with the Fourscore app is available through just the Fourscore regular payment. Fourscore Pro does, um, it is an annual subscription. So every year in July, I pay $10 to Fourscore to use Fourscore Pro. And you might wonder why I would invest in that if Fourscore regular has everything I could ever want. Fourscore Pro has the coveted face gesture feature for page turns. If you haven't heard about this, I can turn my own pages without ever moving my hands off of the keys. I just have to use a twitch of my mouth and it turns my page. So it's really, really a cool feature. I have used it every day since I first purchased this and I think I got it in 2018 was when I got the Pro. So I'll demonstrate that in our tutorial um, shortly. Um, it has a couple other features, quick access pop-up menu, a full page copy and paste, separate profile. So if you're sharing your account with another user or even the iPad itself, you can click through different profiles and um, each have your own library of music totally separated. Um, and there's some more or stamps. So stamps are uh, flats, sharps, um, key changes, anything that you might have in regular music notation, you have a stamp for it. So you can make additional markings, which I'll show you here shortly. So actually now we're going to be starting the four score tutorial. Now um, I'm going to make a hopefully quick transition here to um, my iPad so that I can share my screen of my uh, of my Fourscore app here. So, okie dokie. So here we are in Fourscore. Well, let's start at the beginning. So um, how do we import a score? So I'm just going to use a emailed score here, which is, I sent it to myself. Here we go. We've pulled it up in our email. A lot of times I get um, choir music via email or accompanying music via email. So I pull it up here and anytime that you have it in your Apple products, you have this share button in the top left corner and you can do so many things, but we're going to scroll this bar through our apps and here's our four score button. And that's just going to pull it into our four score app right away. Um, there are two other methods for importing that I would uh, share with you, but I want to make sure that I have time for everything that I wanted to get through today. So that will be shared in the subsequent videos. So we've imported our score now and great. We have it here. Everything works. I can click through it. Awesome. Oh, I forgot to mention four score does function in both a portrait mode. Um, and so that works really well for portrait pieces, but it also works really well in the um, in the landscape mode, which is what I'll keep it in for today because it is really good size for our recording here for viewing. So um, the first thing we want to talk about is the metadata. So when we click on our title here at the very top, we get a drop down menu with all these different options. And it can seem a little overwhelming, but this is the foundation for how we organize our music in Fourscore. So I will first um, type in my title, um, something simple like this, and then maybe I want to include the BWV number. Um, even the composers here act as a, an organizational tool. So um, I have previously had, oh, I misspelled Takata, how embarrassing. Wait, that's not right either. There we go. I have previously had other scores by Bach in my file. So there's two things that I could do. I could use the drop down menu so that I can find his name right away. Or if I know what I have him under, I can just type it in. So I have all of his music listed under Johann Sebastian Bach. However, if I were to type just Bach, it would create a separate folder for the two. So that's why we want to always keep consistency between our 
names. So if you're using full names, use full names always or last name only. Um, genre, you can make these up. There is no, there is no requirement for what you list under genre. You could list by period. You could do uh, Baroque, Renaissance, Classical, Romantic, however you want. I have chosen in this um, to do just organ repertoire and piano repertoire. And uh, the reason for that is I'll show in our organizational method here in a moment. Um, tags, again, you can make these up. I don't even know what I have here. Oh, I have tagged them by um, the style of composition. So I'm just going to drop this one under Toccata. Um, labels, again, let's see, what do I have? Oh, I have exercise and processionals. I could make a different label here. You know, I could do something like spooky, and then that will now come up for my Halloween concert. Perfect. Um, Reference again, reference has to do with however you want to refer to this piece. So let's say that I want to say that this was um, uh, da -da, dramatic. Now I have a reference. This was dramatic, something like that. You can go even further. I don't do this for every one of my pieces, but just to continue the example, I can rate this piece and say, oh, this is my favorite piece ever, but also it's moderately difficult. And so now I have these labels that will help me as I'm looking through my music. Let's say I'm at church Sunday morning. I'm like, what am I going to play? I can look for something that's easy and interesting, you know? So you have these sort of features that can really help minimize and organize your music. Um, again, back to the Sunday thing, if I needed a prelude that was five minutes, I can type in here and know that this piece, I don't know how long it is, um, or how long I would take to play it, I should say, I'm going to say it's four minutes and 20 seconds. And now I can know, oh, this is a good, this is a right, about the right amount of time that I would want to spend for my prelude. Um, and you can even select the key. So D minor. So um, there's there's so many things here in the metadata that will really help organize our music. And um, going further down here, we have even more buttons, <laughs> so many buttons. The one I want to look at real quickly is libraries. So you can actually segregate your music even further by having different libraries of music. So my three that I have currently is contemporary Christian, organ, and church. Um, I have the Contemporary Christian. That one is full of all of the music that I got while playing for my Southern Baptist Church. They used a lot of lead sheet music. And so I have it all stored in there. So that's not going to ever mix with my organ repertoire music because I have all of my organ repertoire music in the organ care uh, folder. Same thing with the church. It has its own folder. And each of these also have their own genres. So I have selected in my church folder here to have choral music, organ solos, piano solos, duets, harmoniz reharmonizations, instrumental. So there are so many categories, subcategories, and breakdowns for how we organize our music. It's really unbelievable. It can feel a little bit overwhelming, but going back to our um, our organ folder, I can find that Bach piece by clicking composer and going to Bach, and then where's my, see right here at the very top. I can look for it by how recently I uploaded it, so that's why it's at the top here. Also the same thing with, oops, with newest uh, by title, so by first letter, rating, so my rating, this is the only one I've got rated, so it's here at the top, et cetera. So there's so many ways to locate the score very quickly. Um, genre, I have it under organ repertoire, tags, I have it under Toccata, I have another one there. Um, labels, I have it under spooky. So the meta metadata here really, really, oh, this is for a different piece, really, really helps um, organize your music for you. Um, I'm not going to look into bookmarks currently. I'll do that in a later session, but I did want to talk about set lists because that is such a useful tool. So the set list feature, feature allows you to put together all of your music for one specific event. So for example, I use this for my recital that I gave, I don't know, a couple months ago. Um, and so I had all of these pieces that I was giving for my recital, which I used my iPad to, to present. And so what happens is, is I can click on my piece here and I can play through it 
it's going great. You know, I played well. I get to the end, and instead of having to go and look for the next piece, I can click. Oh, I didn't click on this one. I can click, and it will take me. What is? Oh, it's sinking. My bad. I'm sorry. It will take me to the next. What is happening? Hmm, I think it's a little bit lagging here. Let's see if I can get it to not lag. Interesting. Let me try a different one. You know, my go to for any time anything kind of glitches out on my uh, four score is to just refresh the app. Um, that tends to fix things. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. Sometimes this might be a good moment to talk about glitches because they do happen occasionally. Sometimes when you leave your app open on your iPad and close the screen down or let it um, let your screen darken to where it's closed off, it sort of resets your score. And so that can be a little bit challenging. So before I do, I do any performances, I refresh the app and I click through and make sure that all of my sheets are there. And that's another topic that we'll talk about shortly. Um, so as I was saying, we walk through and we've got our entire piece. We get to the end, we click through and it'll automatically take you to the next piece. So that makes it really simple to walk through your entire recital without having to constantly go back and search for the next piece. Everything just sort of lines up page after page. Um, so I've used that for um, for recitals, it's also really helpful for um, Christmas concerts, church concerts, uh, wedding services that you have to play. So this was, um, so you go to, I went to a different library and your entire set list for this other library is entirely different. So you have an entirely different set of set list pieces there. Um, another really fun thing about the set lists is that you can create folders. So if I wanted to create a folder, I would hit the info button here and I would select my new folder and type in, let's say I want to do it as recitals. So now that one's in my recitals folder and I can actually import other files into that folder and find a much more inclusive way of um, connecting all of my recitals into one file. There we go. And so there you have multiple set lists in one folder. So that's really, really fun um, to work on is to organize. And I, I constantly have to go back and reorganize my files because I add so much music. So every couple of months I go back and start organizing again. So um, just a couple of features here real quick. This metronome is very interesting for one specific feature. It works just like any regular metronome does. However, um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it. It has the audible version. And then additionally, it has a visible version. So I don't know if you can see this, but the edges of my screen here are actually blinking your rhythm for you. So if there's ever a time that you have to make a transition of your metronome, uh, I mean, of your of your pacing, you can use a blind, a visible one instead of an audible one. Your metronome also stays functional to that piece. So this staccato that I'm in, I, I had it set at 92 beats per minute in 4-4. Four, four. However, if I were to go to a different piece and click on this one, now it's 75 beats per minute at 3-4. So your metronome links to your music. So it'll stay with whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, perfect. So let's talk a little bit uh, briefly about our basic annotations. So back to our import score here. If you click this top right button and hit annotate, it pulls up your menu bar. This is also accessible by just holding your finger down on the screen and it'll pop up. So on this toolbar, we're going to go through a few of these. The, starting on the left side, we have those stamps that I was talking about. 
So stamps are different musical notation options here. And you can use these to add into your score wherever you need. So if I wanted to add a flat, I could add it in anywhere. You can also select the color. So for example, I've started doing a lot of things in red and um, it just makes it easier. Let's say just like that. And it's easily just right there. Um, you have uh, different shapes. So if you wanted to circle something, you could, or if you just wanted to make, to, to make some kind of a mark. Um, the one that I use the most is this section right here at the top, uh, just slightly to the left. These are different pencil types. So you can um, double click it and it pulls up all of the ways that you can edit this pencil type. You can make it larger, you can make it more transparent, you can do all different kinds of colors. Um, and you just save them there as sort of your default um, uh, pencils. So I have these for marking, you know, my pedaling, and I have, you know, um, highlighters for any specific feature that I want to highlight. Also, I have different colors for different things. So, uh, for example, I have done, um, I have practiced one piece and marked everything in red. And then after going and doing a master class with a professor, I will mark whatever their notes were in blue so that I can keep track of where I'm getting what um, and how that uh, would impact my playing. So there's all those different kinds of pencil features. We have this ruler feature uh, by clicking the first to the right here. Um, and that just, I guess, helps you keep things lined up, but I've never really used it. It's just there if you want it. Um, this uh, sort of selection bar allows you to select things and then either copy it, cut it out, paste it somewhere else, et cetera. You do have a typing feature um, that allows you to write whatever you'd like. Um, but I find myself doing most of my writing with the actual pencil. So that was with my with my Apple Pencil. So if I were to use my finger, um, this is my high. Maybe I can make it smaller. I don't know. Not too bad. Um, it's pretty good for general markings, not very good for very detailed markings. If I use my pencil, we have, it's much more handwriting styled. So, um, and I find that it's just much easier to control if I have the pencil option. I just used the eraser. That was pretty obvious. You have a size there. This trash can could be uh, the most scariest of the features. If you hit clear, it clears the entire page. So if you have a bunch of notations and you really just wanted to erase one thing, use the eraser or the back button if it was a, a recently done um, notation there's my back button and you can go backwards or forwards. Um, I try and stay clear away, uh, clear from the trash can because it just gives me a little bit of anxiety to think of losing all of my notations on one page. And then this last button here is layers, which is probably like the coolest feature that we have in the notations. And I'm not sure that I'll have enough time to get into how I use it today, but um, it will most definitely be in our subsequent videos because it um it's just very easy to use and makes my life so much easier. So um, let's talk about page turns. There are actually five types of page turns that we can use in Fourscore, which that means there's something for everybody. Um, you know the typical uh, page turn by tapping, um, nice and easy. Uh, you can also, I didn't mention this, but you can, uh, I didn't plan to mention this, but you can actually select how you want your page turn to uh, turn. So if there's a specific type of turn that you prefer where um, you don't want to see the curl or you don't want to see um, a slide, you can even just set it to off and whatever you tap for the next page turn, it just immediately shows up. So everybody can really customize how they want to manage their page turns here. Um, there are several others, but I'm going to talk about the facial gesture feature. You can access this by double clicking on the screen. You have a couple of options on the screen uh, for how you view it. Um, there is the, the furthest button to the bottom on the left has these two arrows, and that takes you into what is called performance mode. That has removed the toolbar at the top. So now it is not going to be um, there's no chance of you editing anything. If I were to tap it with my Apple Pencil, normally that would allow me to edit it, but in performance, it doesn't. 
you exit performance by hitting that little blue um, X at the top right corner. Again, um, if you hold down, double tap the screen, you get this weird looking smiley face. And again, this is a um, Fourscore Pro feature. If you tap this smiley face, turns nice and white. You now, let's go here to the beginning. Now you have the ability to turn it. I don't know if I can show this. Anyways, oh, I'll show you my face here. So I'm looking at my screen and I just, slightly twitched my lips and it moved my screen. This one, this particular score needs to be cropped a bit because it's not exactly functioning how we'd want it to. But ideally, you can go forwards and backwards. It looks a little silly when you're looking at my face and I've had people comment on it. Um, but for the most part, I find myself in lofts where nobody can see me. And so then it really doesn't matter what I look like. They do have an option for using your head as a tilting. Here we have Fourscore Pro under our settings and we can go to face gestures. So there is a head turn option. I just find that sometimes I'm reaching for um, stops or trying to look at my canter or whoever, my music director, and I don't want it to get confused with my looking away as an indication for turning the page. So I use mouth movement. You also have the option to calibrate it if something feels a little bit off. You can increase or decrease the sensitivity so that it's easier for it to read it and turn the page. I have both of mine set right about the middle and it works really, really well. I find that too far to the uh, to high sensitivity makes it too easy and I double turn pages. Um, I do have the option to do a backwards navigation. So I just turn the opposite way with my mouth. And in practice, I actually will take time to practice turning my page back because you get really set on the turning the page forward that if something were to happen and I make a mistake and I wanna go back, you're not trained to turn the page back. And so I actually do spend some time practicing turning my page back in case there's ever a uh, mistake. So, um, so those are some really great, um, that's probably my favorite feature of the um, pro version. Um, and I use it like I said, every day. So one last thing that I wanted to talk about here. Oh, this was the score that I mentioned. I have multiple uh, notations here. Um, in red, I have my uh, registration for the uh, organ here on campus with my initial fingering markings and pedaling markings. So everything that's in red was the first time through that I learned it. Everything in blue was after I attended an Isabel Demmer masterclass. And these were the tips that she gave me. So specifically the down trill at this measure, um, these were her notes, you know, shorter time. Anything in blue was her separation of this section, more crossing pedal line. And so um, it's great because now I'll always have her notes on this music. And I love that. Um, purple was after I had not played this piece for a long time, I came back to it and I'm sure you've all experienced coming back to a piece, things are a little bit different. You play it a little bit more, maybe comfortably, but also with a different sort of style and sense of, of understanding. Um, sometimes I um, give myself uh, notations on what the music is doing. And then uh, green was, I suppose, another, another set of uh, registrations, I mean, uh, markings for myself. So I think it's great that there are different options for color, but uh, I wanted to spend the last few minutes we had here on backups because it is important for um, someone interested in putting all of their music in one place that there are options for not losing um, uh, your music. So here we have um, backup on the far right button. Oh, I said I was going to keep it this way. On the far right button, you come down here under more and there is a backup option. So under backups, we have um, recently deleted, recently updated, and then these are some of the backups that I've made in the past. Um, we also have ways that you can export your entire folder, exporting or importing. If somebody else has a library and says, hey, do you want some of my music? You know, that's one way to do it. But we'll talk about that also in just a second. This plus button here at the bottom allows you to create a backup or create an archive. So, um, your uh, backup saves your current files through basically the cloud. And there is a syncing option that you saw earlier. So 
um, your, it saves your metadata, your annotations, your set list, your setting. It's just a whole backup of the entire uh, file, all the files that you have. The archive um, saves the same information, but it actually includes a copy of each of the documents, each of the scores. So that takes a little bit more disk space. I probably do it in archive every six months, something like that. And then I do backups a little bit more regularly. Um, I, you have the option of taking a, an archive and restoring it to your library. So if I wanted to go back to whatever it is that I had saved at this time, it would remove everything that I have added since then. So I normally don't do that unless there is some sort of major glitch and I lose all my stuff, the archive will have it all saved. Um, what I have started doing is taking these archives and um, sending them to my computer. Actually, what I'll do is I have um, Fourscore as the app on my on my MacBook Pro. Like I mentioned, they you have the app on iPhone, iPad, and MacBook Pro. So I have the app on my MacBook Pro. And every couple of weeks, hmm, I should say, every couple of months, I um, send all of my files to that app on my computer via a, a backup or an archive, and then I save them there. So that would be my last checkpoint of music by saving it to my computer. Um, and then of course you do have the syncing to the iCloud option by hitting sync right above the backup. You can sync with iCloud and you can see my last sync was, oh, five minutes ago. So that one does it automatically and it stores it. Um, this one I says, I did not, I did want it to have a backup, so. Um, yeah, a lot of options with uh, saving your scores. I've never lost anything that I couldn't get back. So that's really uh, a great feature to have. And um, I think that that is, ooh, well done, Lindsay. I got it all done in time. Um, I did get one question early on, which was um, eye fatigue, which is a real concern with a lot of these uh, technologies. Um, so. I uh, recommend using um, the adjusting the light of your iPad. So your iPad will automatically set the light to a certain setting, but you can dim it or brighten it based on what you want to, to have hitting your eyes. So if you're in a darker space, don't have the brightness all the way up because that's a harsher light on your eyes. If you're in a moderately light space, then you can brighten it a little bit more. So um, those are really good uh, tools. The, the adjustable light is great. And then of course, taking uh, breaks. So that's good for you as a person who is practicing to take breaks occasionally, but also for your eyes and uh, for your ment mental well-being. So breaks are always good. And then um, I did see that you could get artificial eye drops, uh, which if you have more severe problems with eye fatigue, then that would be a way to go. And of course, glasses nowadays, you can get like the blue infrared that helps prevent um, uh, eye fatigue from, from computers and from tablets. So uh, I think I've gotten a couple of questions here in the messages. Um, does four score have a free trial. So I did look that up. And from what I remember, I don't believe that there is a free trial right now. So it would be pretty much a get it for $10 for the year. And then you don't re, re uh, subscribe if you didn't appreciate the for the free trial, uh, or the, the one year of the pro but that's kind of what I thought I was going to do, and I just never went back, and I like the face gesture changes, so I, I appreciate that. Can you turn pages with some sort of Bluetooth mouse button? Perfect. Yeah, so I have had some colleagues get a Bluetooth button, um, and it does function really well with the iPad. The Fourscore does have the Bluetooth um, compatibility, even just the regular version, not the Pro. Um, so yeah, that's definitely an option. Um, I do find that it can be a little bit challenging. I have seen some people uh, stick it underneath the console and then hitting it with the top of their knee. So that was very, I want to say, inventive of them. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, there are, like I said, five ways of turning pages. And one of the more interesting ones that I'll talk about more in another video is by using a cue. So you can actually have the sheet music on your phone and have someone in the audience turn the pages from your phone and it turns the pages on your iPad. So I have done that for one of my professors and um, it went 
swimmingly, although I was very nervous. <laughs> so I would highly recommend practicing it uh, before before just using it in performance. But yeah, so that is also done by Bluetooth. So you don't even have to purchase a button. You know, you can just use your your phone. Um, I think um, I think those were all the questions I had here. So uh, can we open it up for anybody else that has questions that wants to jump in right now? Yeah, so the page turn pedal, I, I see a lot of pianists and uh, other musicians using that, but they of course have free extra free extremities, their legs are not busy. Can you talk about the zones of the screen that you touch to do different things? Sure. Um, so, for example, let's see here. Um, so if I want to do a page turn. I will tap on on the side that I want to turn the page for. So I think I ran out of pages. So if I wanted to go, it's because I'm holding it weird. Okay, there we go. So if I wanted to go backwards, you just tap on the bottom side of the screen forwards the opposite side. Um, to get to annotate, of course you can, uh, if you just click in the middle, that will get your drop down menu to show up. And so that's an easy, uh, option there. Uh, all the buttons are accessible through that top menu. If you hold down on the screen, that brings the annotate bar up. That's one way to access it. Of course, you could also just tap on the annotate button from the drop down menu. Um, what were some of the other ones? So if you double tap the screen, you get that display mode option with the, um, with the facial gestures and the performance practice. And then of course, to exit performance practice, it's just that little blue X in the corner. Um, let's see. So if you tap, and this, this one's a general one for iPad, there's three dots at the top of your screen here. I'm not sure if we can see that, but if you tap those three dots, it allows you to consider adding multiple pages to your iPad. So if you wanted to have multiple things open, you can, but um, I'm trying to think, what else I usually tap? I think that that's pretty much all I tap. Did you have, was that helpful? How do you annotate or erase an annotation that is behind the annotate menu when it's open? Ah, interesting. So um, let's, let's just try that out. So I've got, maybe I can share this again. So I, I've got a uh, score pulled up here. I'm going to annotate something here and I'm just gonna put it specifically where I know it's going to be uh, behind the uh, sheet there. So if I'm here and I tap on the annotate screen and it's dropped down behind the menu, let's see, it's kind of laggy. There we go. It's dropped down behind the menu, right? So I'm trying to erase it, but I can't see it. So I'm just going to zoom it in with my fingers, just by by getting my fingers close together and expanding them. And it's just gonna bring it in right here. And there we go, all, and then I can zoom it back out. And that's just done by the two fingers on the screen, zooming in and zooming out. You can do just simple manipulation with your, with your uh, screen. So um, yeah, that was a brilliant question. Um, for adding fingering and registration, do you use the zoom feature? the zoom feature, like the zoomed in feature. Is that what, what the question is? Like this? Um, uh, well, you can, it's definitely easy to just zoom in and annotate that way. Um, and it works just as well. So you can actually zoom in really, really far with, uh, the annotate. So for example, when I was uh, out on the regular size screen, uh, this was as far as I could zoom in before it would kick me back out, right? So this is the furthest zoom in you could get. But once I hold down my finger on my screen and it opens up the annotate, if I want to, I can zoom in specifically on that one note and get it all marked up. So yeah, there is a really good Zoom feature. I think that's maybe what um, Jonathan is referring to here, but um, if not, you can send me a message and ask for clarification. Um, one of the cool things that I like to do with um, 
annotating that I'll just mention real quickly. Let's see here if I have it. Um, for example, I'll just use this page as an example. Um, I have my one of my pencil options here is this big fat white marker. And the reason I have it there is because that allows me to erase things that are printed on the screen. Now that's a poor example. I didn't want to erase that, but um, sometimes when you scan in certain copies of music, let's see here if I have one that's kind of messy. So for example, on this page here, I have some markings here on the side that I don't want there because I want it to look like a clean PDF. I can use my white pencil and erase that marking and then it's just nice and clean. So that's one of the cool things about that. Another cool thing is that you can actually use that to um, add markings where there might be space, but not normally noted. So I can erase this empty set of measures here and say, oh, I want to add a registration there. And so now I'm not super worried about that because there was nothing there anyway, but it looks really nice and clean for where I want to add my registration. So um, yeah, those are just little hacks that I have learned um, and come up with over the years. I will be going really in depth on everything that I do for marking my scores and um, how I maximize the annotation option with four score in the third of my, uh, of the mini series that I'm, that we're working on right now. Um, but yeah, there are some organ specific hacks that I really think are fun. Oh, um, if you have crooked lines on scan, is there a tool to straighten them? So the scan option here is um, through this, uh, the edit score under add score, you can do scan. So that allows you to um, have a camera here. You tap on the camera button at the top of the screen there and you can scan whatever is around. Um, it does not allow you to straighten the lines, um, but it will, however, let you uh, crop it in exactly how you want it. So you do want to get overhead of a score and scan downwards. I was going to do an example of that, but I knew I was going to be short on time, so I did not. I think it makes me take a picture before getting out of this. Oh, it's all laggy. There we go. Cancel. Perfect. Um, I found you need to be a little careful with the white. If you white out something and then write over it, the eraser will erase both of them, not just the top one. Exactly. The one thing, um, there may be a way around this, but it's something that I noticed in my short time using. Great um, uh, thing to notice, Ruth. That is actually part of the annotating using layers that I was going to talk about it really in depth. Um, and I'm just going to maybe take a second to show you that um, sort of like as a sneak peek of uh, of the webinar series. So this was a tanto that I played um, at ASU and then also while I was in Spain this summer. And so the red markings you see here are all of the um, markings that I made as I was learning the music. Any fingerings, any pedaling. What you see in the green is markings that I used for ASU's organ, which is very different from what I would have used in Spain. And um, uh, they're all here in green. Now, you could just go ahead and write the, the next organ in blue, right, and have multiple registrations, but full registrants, that could get a little bit confusing. So what you can do here by going to your annotate screen, notice I have three layers on right here. So currently, I have my ASU layer visible. If I click this little eye icon, it removes my ASU um, uh, uh, markings, and if I open the the organ from El Espinar, where I was, um, it updates my annotations. So now it's got all of the annotations, all of the registrations that I would have had from using the organ in Spain. So yeah, the layers is like my favorite feature. I, do, I don't use it enough, but this is like, I may never get to go back to this organ, but I have the registrations that I use there, which is so fun to know because, you know, it's, it's the cimbala, the geno, the docena, the flautado. These are things that are more like mementos. I don't want to lose them, but of course I have other places that I would want to play this. So using that annotates feature, you can do it two ways by doing a page layer. So whatever I would write, um, if I added a page layer, it would only be edited on this specific 
page and I would need to do another one for the next page. If you do one for the screen, I mean, for the score, score layers here, it's right above it, that will create a layer over the entire score. And so that's where I put my, my registrations for multiple organs. But for your, um, your issue here, you can create another page layer and then it won't ever erase what's underneath it if you want it. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit of a tidbit of um, some of the annotation things that I really like to incorporate with um, my uh, Fourscore app that are just really, really organ friendly. There are so many like little tips and tricks for organ specific things that I'm so excited to share. Um, I do think though that this is our time. Is that right, Emily? That is correct. Thanks awesome. Thank so you, much, Lindsay. Yeah. All right. Thank you all so much for coming and hope to see you on the next one.